Hello everyone and welcome to my creative writing workshop. My name is Victoria Williamson and I'm a writer who grew up in Kirkintilloch in North Glasgow. So far my books include The Fox Girl and the White Gazelle which is a story about a school bully from Glasgow who makes friends with a Syrian refugee and The Boy with the Butterfly Mind which is also set in Glasgow and it's a story of blended families and ADHD. That's also been translated into Turkish, which is this book cover here. My new book is called Hagstorm, and that's a spooky tale about Robert Burns when he was a boy. And it's a fantasy story based on Tam O'Shanter, and it's about witches. So authors draw inspiration for their books from their local areas, just like I've drawn inspiration from my local area for these books. So for example, my grandparents were from Drumchapel and also from Mary Hill. So I blended those two names into Drum Hill, which is where the Fox Girl and the White Gazelle is set. I also spent a lot of time when I was growing up playing in Dawes Home Park in Annie's Land, and that became Raven's Home Park in the Fox Girl and the White Gazelle. And Kirk and Tilloch is very near Bishop Briggs. So that was the setting for the boy with the butterfly mind. And when I was in primary school, I really enjoyed taking part in the Burns Federation poetry competitions and I still have all my old certificates and that was the inspiration for Hagstorm because I love the poem Tam O'Shanter. So authors draw lots of inspiration from their local area and that's something you could do to write your own stories. Now over lockdown I've spent even more time walking around my local area remembering some of my favourite places when I was a child and thinking about some of the things that happened there and even discovering some local history I didn't know about before. So all of this inspiration from my local area will help me write my books in future and your local area can help you get ideas for your writing too. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing we can try is drawing a map of your local area. So grab a pen and some paper and let's get to work drawing a map. We'll start off with my local area. This is what my local area looked like when I was growing up. There were two rows of houses here and mine was the one at the top marked with an X. And across a busy main road, there was a line of trees and a big wide football field. My friends and I gave names to all of the local places in our area. So just down from our house was somewhere we used to play and that was called the circle. This is the circle. This is where we used to play as kids. There used to be a round tree on this side where we used to climb, but now there's a bin for dog walkers on this side. So here's the map updated with some more rows of houses on either side here. Down from my house used to be a place called The Circle, which is here. And the next important place we used to play was called The Steps. This here is The Steps. Just now they've been boarded up for repairs. But when we were kids, we used to play here a lot. There used to be bushes all down this side and bushes all down this side. And we used to play inside them and pretend they were our dens for hiding in. Here's the next part of the map showing the rest of the houses on either side of the circle and a very important area on either side of the steps, which was called the banking. This here is the banking. In summer, it's full of wildflowers, but in winter, when the grass is cut down, it's brilliant for sledging down. So here's the final part of the map of the area where I grew up. It's this wiggly path here where I used to meet with my friends and it was called the Snakey. This here is the Snakey. When we were kids, we used to come skateboarding and roller skating all the way down here. The only problem was these metal barriers in the way, which were great when we were first learning and they had something to stop us. But when we got a bit better, we ended up bashing into these quite a few times, which wasn't so great. So how can you use a map of your local area to tell a story? Well, one day it was a dark autumn night when my friends and I were about eight or nine years old. We were playing down at the bottom of the steps here. And just in this set of bushes here, we saw something sticking out of the bushes. 
Now we weren't sure of what it was. It looked like it was pink and we thought in the dark that it looked like a human leg. So we were really frightened because we were still very young. So we stood around talking for a long time, asking each other, what do you think it is? Do, do you think it's a dead body? And eventually one of us got the courage to go up to it and have a look. But just as we got right up close, our parents came down the steps and told us it was time to go home to bed. So we all had to go home to our own houses. And in the morning, we all gathered at the circle to go down in a group and find out what it was that was sticking out of the bushes. So we walked down the steps and when we got to the bottom of the steps and looked in the bush, we found whatever it was, was gone. So we never did get to find out what it was that was sticking out of the bushes at the bottom of the steps. To be honest, I think now it was probably a pink plastic bag, but dead body is probably a better story, isn't it? Simple stories just need characters. That's the who in a story. A setting, that's the when and the where of a story, and a beginning, a middle, and an end. But the best stories often follow this five point structure. Here are the five parts of a short story or a novel. It's often called a story arc because of its shape. Here's how a story arc works for my book, The Boy with the Butterfly Mind. In the exposition, we're introduced to two characters and the setting. The book is set in Bishop Briggs and the first character is this girl here called Ellen. She's 11 years old and at the start of the story, she's in primary seven and she's just about to do a math test. And this is how she introduces herself in the story. It was only the third week of primary seven and already everyone hated the Friday morning maths test. Not me. I studied way too hard to get nervous answering a few easy sums, even if our teacher, Miss Morrison, was a dragon who handed out detention to anyone who even sneezed too loud. I had nothing to worry about. I'd never been in trouble for anything in my whole life. Write out 24,062,017 in numbers, the dragon roared, shattering the silence into 24 million 62,017 little pieces. I could almost see the fire from the dragon's breath singeing Lauren's hair as she stopped trying to copy my work and stared blankly at her own book, the numbers already forgotten. Ha, jelly bean brain. That's what you get for cheating and not paying attention. I bit back a grin at how easy the question was and wrote the answer neatly below the last one, making sure to use my very best handwriting. The girl sitting beside me shuffled closer and I could hear her sniffing noises getting louder. Paige Munro's runny nose was like a warning siren. A couple more questions she couldn't answer and she'd be crying all over her maths jotter. My hand flew across my book to cover my answers and I leaned forward trying to protect my work from the hungry eyes of the other kids who were either too stupid to do a few easy sums or too lazy to study. Why should I share anything with them? They all hated me, no matter what I did. So that's Ellen. And at the start of the story, she sounds quite mean, doesn't she? Like she doesn't really care about other people. Well, it turns out the reason why she's mean is she's got a very difficult family situation to deal with. Her parents have divorced and her father has moved away to Edinburgh and he's got remarried and has another baby daughter and Ellen feels like she's been replaced. To add to her problems, her mother has now got a new boyfriend who's moved in with them in Bishop Briggs and although Paul, her mother's boyfriend, is a lovely man, Ellen just wants her dad back so she doesn't like Paul at all even though he tries really really hard so she's so focused on trying to be the best she can be in school to prove to her father that she's just the best girl in the world. And she thinks if she can do that, if she can get top marks in everything and be perfect all of the time, it will convince her father to leave his family in Edinburgh and come back and live with her and her mum again. Now that's not very realistic, but this is Ellen's fairy tale. Now the other character in the story is called Jamie. He's also 11 years old and at the start of the story he's in school in England 
and he's doing a spelling test. And this is how he introduces himself in the exposition. The teacher says to him, did you get that last word, Jamie? The way Mr. Patel says it, I can tell he's had to repeat the question. I nod, even though I've got no idea what the last word in the spelling test was. I lost it somewhere between listening to Ryan, blowing his runny nose like he's trying to play the tuba and watching Claire nervously ripping her notebook into confetti. Mr. Patel says, I distract the other kids, but it's really the other way around. Accommodate, Mr. Patel says again. Accommodate. Jamie, are you writing this down? I snatch up my pen from the floor where it's rolled and try to find a free space on my test sheet to write the word. My handwriting's a bit of a mess and it's not easy trying to squeeze such a big word onto such a little line. Maybe that's part of the test too. Maybe that's why I always fail. Ack, I write. Then I cross it out and try A, C, K, O. No, that's not right either. I scribble over it too hard and accidentally knock over a big stack of books and pen holders I built into a mini castle all round my desk. They go cascading onto the floor like a waterfall and I leap after them like one of those Olympic divers jumping off the high board. I'm so busy gathering books and pens up, I barely hear the laughter of the other kids. It just washes over me now in waves and I'm so used to it, I just go drifting along with it. Jamie, will you please just sit down? Mr. Battelle sounds like he's running out of patience. It's the second year in a row that I'm in his class and I don't think he can take another three terms of me and my craziness. So that's Jamie. Now, Jamie's got some problems of his own. For a start, his parents are also divorced. His father has moved away and his mother has got a new boyfriend, but the new boyfriend is not nice at all and he doesn't like Jamie. He thinks Jamie is noisy and disruptive and he just gets in the way. Jamie's problems are partly because he has ADHD. He's a lovely boy, but he finds it really difficult to focus on things and concentrate on his work in school and he gets very easily distracted. So sometimes in school, the teachers think he's a troublemaker, but he's not. He just finds it really hard to focus. But in the next part of the story, after you've introduced the characters, what you want to have is a conflict or a problem that sets off all of the rest of the action. The problem or conflict in this story is the fact that Jamie's mother decides she's going to move to America with her new boyfriend because her boyfriend is American. And Jamie, instead of going with them, because the boyfriend doesn't like Jamie, they decide they're going to send Jamie to go and live with his father. But Jamie's father is called Paul, who lives in Scotland. And do you remember who Paul is? Well, Paul is Ellen's mother's new boyfriend. So Jamie is going to go and live in Bishop Briggs with Ellen. And Ellen is not happy about this at all because she thinks having Paul and his noisy, disruptive, distracted son is going to make it even harder to get her own dad back. So she decides she's going to make it as difficult as possible for Jamie to fit in with the family. So this sets off all of the rising action in the rest of the story. The rising action is a series of small events that leads up to the big climax of the story. So event one in this story is that Jamie is put in the same class as Ellen in her school. And Ellen is furious about this because she feels that having this noisy, disruptive boy in the class is going to make it even harder for her to become popular. And she's desperate to get some friends. Event two is Ellen's plan to become popular. She thinks if she holds the best birthday party in the world ever and invites all of the girls in her class to the Adventure Dome, then this will prove that she's actually pretty cool and the other kids should really like her. And it actually works. They all have a great time. It's a fantastic event. But when they come back to Ellen's class, um, house to have some birthday dinner, 
it all goes badly wrong because Jamie gets overexcited and he does something so terrible that Ellen can't forgive him for it. And I'm not going to tell you what that is. You'll have to read the book to find out. But it's something pretty bad. The last event before the climax is that Ellen has a chance to prove to her father that she is the best student in the whole school because there's going to be a big Glasgow science fair in the SECC in Glasgow and all of the schools have been invited to select one entry to put forward to the science fair and Ellen is desperate to get her entry chosen to represent her school so she works at it for weeks and weeks and puts in a really great entry but on the day of the judging when the judges come to her school to pick her school's entry she finds out something terrible she didn't know that Jamie has a talent and his talent is for science so this is what she finds out on the day of the competition and this is the climax of the story the big action. She says, the teachers were all gathered at a table further down the hall, looking at Jamie's display. He'd already run off at top speed to go and wreak havoc in the playground. So I was the one who heard everything the teachers had to say about his entry. It's really impressive, isn't it? Our teacher, Miss Morrison said, this'll definitely be the one the judges pick to represent our school. Behind her, I caught a glimpse of Jamie's science experiment and my breath caught painfully in my throat. It was brilliant. I hadn't paid any attention to what chemicals he was mixing up in his room these last few weeks or what he'd been cooking up in pots in the kitchen with Paul. I was so focused on my own butterfly art display. I didn't even look to see what he was unpacking onto his table this morning. There was an amazing miniature garden with blue, green and pink crystals growing on pebbles and sprouting from tiny plant pots. At the end of the table was a big rock candy tree with lollipop sticks covered in boiled sugar and crystals and sign next to it saying, taste me. On the wall behind it was a poster covered in rock candy recipes and photographs showing each stage of the crystal growing process. My stomach gave a sick lurch when I realised our teacher was right. Jamie was going to win. Jamie was going to be the one to represent our school at the Glasgow Science Fair in the conference centre in May. It was so unfair. I wanted to scream. I went back to class to get my jacket, but instead of heading out to the playground, I went to the girls' toilets instead. I felt so sick with anger and jealousy, I wanted to throw up, but that wasn't why I was hiding there. I knew what I had to do. I clutched the edge of the sink and stared at my pale face in the mirror. My fairy tale ending was slipping out of my grasp and there was only one way I could get it back and get my dad back now. You can do it, I whispered to my reflection. You have to. I waited till I was sure the teachers would all be in the staff room. Then I slipped out and headed back to the assembly hall. Jamie was never going to forgive me for what I was about to do. But was I ever going to be able to forgive myself? And that leads to what Ellen does next, which is the climax of the story. What do you think she does? Well, I'm not going to tell you. You have to read the book to find out but she does something really, really bad. And that sets off the climax of the story where everything starts to fall apart. Her mother and Paul split up and Paul and Jamie move out. And Ellen starts to discover that actually she misses them. She was starting to feel like she'd become part of a family. So the falling action is when things start to get resolved and people start to become friends who weren't friends before. So Ellen and Jamie start to discover they do actually have things in common, even though they thought they were very different and they do start to become more friendly in school. And then they realise they have one final chance to make everything work because there's going to be a one uh, final entry that's allowed in the competition and that's for group entries. So they think if we can put 
our group entry together, if we can work together and overcome our differences, we might still have a chance of winning this science fair. So that's what they do. And that leads to the resolution of the story. The resolution is the ending of a story where all of the loose ends are tied up and we get to find out all of the things we didn't know before. Now, it doesn't have to be a happy ending. It can be a sad ending, it can even be a cliffhanger ending, but we generally do need to have all of the story endings tied up neatly so that the reader comes away feeling like they've read a complete story from start to finish. So perhaps you can use the story arc to write your own stories. You can use your local area to inspire a poem, a diary entry, or even a short play. How else can you use your local environment to inspire your writing? Well, you might like to try writing a piece of non-fiction. When I was growing up, my brother and I really wanted the council to build a skateboarding park as the snakey wasn't very easy to skateboard down and it wasn't nearly big enough. So one day in 1991, we sat down together and we wrote a letter to our local council. Well, we didn't ever get a response to our letter, but 18 years later in 2009, this skateboard park here was built in the very spot we'd asked for it. Now, I don't know if our letter had anything to do with this skateboard park being built, but it just goes to show if you don't ask for something, you don't get it. So if there's something you'd like your local council to build, then maybe you could try writing a letter and see if you get a response and get something built for your local community. Now it's over to you. Is there something you'd like to write to your local newspaper or even school head teacher about? Is there a busy road you'd like made safer by putting traffic calming measures in place? Is there a lot of rubbish on a local beach you'd like to write to the newspaper about to get volunteers to help clean it up? Would you like your school to build a football pitch, a basketball court or picnic benches in the school playground? How are you going to use your writing to engage with your local area? Do you have a favourite place to meet your friends that you'd like to write a story about? Do you have a favourite tree or shop you'd like to write a poem about? Is there something you'd like to write to your local newspaper about or get your school involved in? Is there an issue you'd like to write a school blog post about to get other people in your community involved in? I'd love to see the maps of your local area that you draw and read your pieces of writing, whether they're fiction or non-fiction. You can send them to me through my website at www.strangelymagical.com and I'll put them up on my author website on a special On5 summer programme page. Thanks for watching.